Okay, last time we were talking about the acquisition of assets, and we need to talk about the advantages and the disadvantages. Uh, first of all, there is no danger of a majority or of a significant minority holding out. Remember earlier we talked about when we're buying stock, we want to get, well, we have to probably have to get at least greater than or equal to two thirds to get the job done. We need greater than 80% in order to not pay the taxes. Mr. Russell Wogel, are you okay? I think he's lost something. You okay? <laughs> oh, oh my goodness, this is sad. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, so everyone will stop looking at you. I'm going to stop talking about the situation, except to say that hat makes you look like a longshoreman. Oh! Okay. So. Um, Remember, we said you got to have at least two thirds to get the job done. You got to have at least 80% to avoid the tax situation. And so even though you might get 50% plus one to go along with your uh, acquisition of stock, you might miss out on a lot of you being able to take over and then the benefits, the tax benefits. So doing it this way, you don't have to worry about that. 50% plus one of the votes and you can do an acquisition of uh, assets. Disadvantage. Remember earlier we talked about the titling? If I did the rental car thing and I had to retitle 2000, Mr. Scott told us how horrible that experience is and, and it's the same experience everyone here has had. Uh, imagine doing that for thousands and thousands of cars. Of course, you're gonna have to get some lawyers involved and lawyers are not cheap. So uh, that's why we would prefer to avoid those legally co legal costs if we can. What if the company you were buying really only had one big asset. That disadvantage might not be a big deal, right? So you want to look at the target and think about whether or not this is going to be an issue. Questions? Okay, now we are going to skip forward and this is 20-something uh, slides in and we're going to talk about the cost of an acquisition. The cost of an acquisition. So, What's the goal of financial management? Maximize shareholder wealth. Maximize shareholder wealth. And when we're doing NPV analysis, what does that mean? What's the rule? Positive accept. Yeah, we accept anything greater than zero. And so what we're going to do is be using that same guideline, that same hard and fast rule, as far as uh, these acquisitions. Because after all, these acquisitions are a project the company is undertaking and they are also responsible for maximizing shareholder wealth. So let's talk about the incremental gain from an acquisition. Does anyone remember what incremental means from chapter eight? Increases. Increases, okay, so uh, over and above what we would have had otherwise, right? I'm, I'm missing like three people here that I usually pick on. Or two people now. Okay. I, I guess I'll have to pick on Ms. Avila. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll get you next. Okay. So um, incremental. We're look, so here's the question. If you've got two companies and this one has $100 million in net income and it goes out and buys this company that has $50 million in net income, should it say, oh, hey, we're getting an extra $50 million in net income? It's not incremental. Nothing has changed, right? You're just adding these two things together. Nothing has changed. And so the argument has to be that we're going to put these things together and uh, we're going to have what's called synergy. Now I'm going to pick on Ms. Avila. Ms. Avila, what is synergy? I'm not sure. Oh, oh my, Mr. Power Ranger. It's like uh, two things work together and they both complement each other. Okay, and then what does that lead to? Uh, more money. Oh, I like that. More <laughs> money. Okay, so the sum, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So it's the old 2 plus 2 equal 5, right? In this case, we've got 100 plus 50, and when we put them together, we darn well better have something north of 150 in, in net income out of this deal, or we don't have any incremental net income. Does that make sense? Okay. So, a lot of times you hear um, 
managers say, oh yeah, we're gonna buy that company and it's gonna boost our EPS, earnings per share. I don't care. What I care about is, are you producing more than the two companies independently, right? And we're gonna talk about where these sources of synergy come from, and they come from a lot of different places. But uh, so what we're gonna find here is that we're gonna define delta V as that change in value as a result of the acquisition. It's the change in value as a result of the acquisition. And so we've got uh, two firms here, A and B. And we're gonna call A the acquirer, and B is the target. A is the acquirer, B is the target. And V, A, B together is the combined firm. That's after the merger, after the merger. V sub A is the value of the standalone, the standalone value of the acquirer. Now, how do I get the standalone value? By the way, we're only going to talk about all equity firms here because when you throw debt in here, it gets a little messier and we're not quite that advanced here. This is advanced financial management, but it's not advanced advanced financial management, right? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to say that standalone value of A is the value of the equity of firm A. And how would I find that? How about the number of shares outstanding times the share price? Go ahead and draw a little arrow there, say number of shares outstanding times the share price. So that's a B sub A is for the acquirer, B sub B is the target. Mr. Osawawu, can you tell me how are we going to get the standalone value of the target? What two things must we multiply together? Value of A and B. Oh, swinging at this. Ms. Wabi, what two things do I need to multiply together to get? So, shares outstanding and the share price? Yeah, the shares outstanding and the share price. That was the next thing on your mind, wasn't it? <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> he is so honest. I, I love that. About no, him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, so and then if we do this, so we're looking at how much is this thing worth put together? Minus the standalone value of this thing, uh, the, the, the acquirer minus the standalone value of the target. If this thing is positive, then we have what is called synergy. Then we have what's called synergy. And at this point, you might be thinking, aha, we're going to accept any acquisition with incremental gain greater than zero. But that's not quite true. And we'll explain to you why that is here in just a second. The first thing we want to do is uh, establish this new kind of variable, VB star, VB star. Now, obviously this is, has to be a value of the target. The star means it's not the same as the standalone value of the target. VB star, it turns out, is the absolute most that you're willing to pay for the target. So. If we take the standalone value of B, which is just the number of shares times the share price for the target, and we add delta V, that's the incremental gain, that is the absolute most that we would be willing to pay for the target. Now, I will tell you this, all of the gain of the merger, if we pay VB star, if we pay VB star, all of the gain of the merger goes to the target shareholders because they're gonna get all that money. None of it is gonna stay with uh, the, uh, the shareholders of A. By the way, as the acquiring manager, which set of shareholders am I responsible to? Your own. My own, right? I am responsible to the shareholders of A, and it's my job to maximize their wealth. Do, at this point in my career, do I care about the target shareholders? Absolutely not. They're not my problem. I'm, you guys are my shareholders. I'm responsible for making you rich. And so what that means is when I undertake these projects, I darn well better pay something less than VB star or the entire gain of the merger is going to the target shareholders. So let's talk about how then we use this to calculate NPV. NPV is equal to VB star minus the cost to firm A to acquire firm B. 
So the only way that thing is positive is if I'm paying less than VB star to acquire the firm. And the less I pay, the more of the gains go to my shareholders. Does that make sense? Because any money extra that I pay out goes to the target shareholders, not my current shareholders. And so what I want to do is pay, first of all, pay as little as possible, right? But for darn sure, we want to make sure we pay less than VB star. Now, what happens here if you end up paying more than VB star for the target? It's a negative. That's a negative MVP project. I'm going to give Mr. Osawagwu another chance. Mr. Osawagwu, if it's a negative MPV project, should we do it? No! We'd be destroying shareholder value. And so we're not going to do that. Now, in the real world, what do you think happens? It's Sometimes you lose. Yeah, a lot of times. And here's why. Once you read the Huber's hypothesis, you'll see that managers tend to make some pretty bad calls and they tend to overpay and the gains almost always end up going to the target shareholders. And the way you can tell is when the announcement is made of this takeover and they say how much they're gonna pay, if the bidding firm's share price goes down, that lets you know the shareholders think it's a bad idea and it's a negative NPV project. And we'll get more into that when we talk about the hubris hypothesis. Okay, so long story short, we only want to accept positive NPV acquisitions. Now, remember though, that this delta V, where do you think that comes from? Do you think that's a hard and fast scientific number? No, what is it? It's a swag, it's a scientific wild ass guess. And in fact, this scientific wild ass guess Who's it made by? It's made by the acquiring managers. And so it's likely to be larger, their estimate of delta V is likely to be larger than it actually is. And here's why. Do managers think they're great? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, they think they're great. And so they are always overestimating how much uh, uh, improvement they can wring out of this arrangement. Always, because you know, after all, they're freaking great. Do you think self-doubters tend to get into CEO jobs? No. Okay, so I'll give you an example here. When Halliburton was buying Dresser, I was working for Halliburton, and I was told I was gonna go down to this comp uh, a plant on the south side of Dallas. I was on the north side. I was gonna go to the south side of Dallas, and I was told, these people are morons. What you're gonna go down there and do is bring them the gospel of the Halliburton way. And we're gonna go down there and we're gonna clean up, we're gonna save a lot of money, it's gonna be great. And I'm like, woohoo! When I got down there, it turns out they actually had their crap together. Turns out they were actually doing better than us in some respects. And so that big Delta V that Hal Burton was expecting out of this transaction, I don't think it ever materialized. I don't think it materialized at all. Okay. But it did lead to me laying up 79 people on my 28th birthday. You know, so there's that. That kind of sucked. It was worse for them than me though. Okay, back to the story. How are we going to, let's do an example here. So we have firm A, which is our acquirer, and firm B, which is the target. Both firms are 100% equity. All the examples and problems I work will be 100% equity. We estimate that delta V is equal to 100. Now firm B, what's the standalone value of firm B? How do we get it? Number of shares times price. Yeah, the number of shares <laughs> times the share price. So uh, we know that the total market value of firm B is 100. That is actually our very best guess of what the firm is worth by itself because in an efficient market, that price is correct. Okay, so if uh, we've got 100 and then delta V is 100, what is VB star? Yeah. 
So delta D um, plus BB, and that's going to give us 100 plus 100 is 200. Okay, so we know we shouldn't pay any more than 200. And the board is offering to sell for 150. Now, that 150, we can break down into two pieces. There's the standalone value, and everything over and above that is called the merger premium. So that 100 is the standalone value, that extra 50 that we're throwing in there, that's called the merger premium. And we always have to include a merger premium in our offer. Any idea why? Ms. Avila. I'm guessing they won't take it if you just give them the Yeah. Price. So right now these shares are trading at 10. If I want to sell my shares at 10, boop. All I do is get and log into my deal and I don't have to mess with you, right? But if you're wanting to get me to sell my shares, you've got to offer me more than. By the way, can you tell me how much per share these are these folks are offering? They're offering 150. How many shares are outstanding? 10. So therefore, they must be offering how much per share? 15. The math isn't hard. A lot of multiplication, a lot of division. Okay, so um, let's see what we've got so far. So, so far, I think we've got everything covered here. So firm A is, so by the way, there's two ways we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about an all cash acquisition and we're going to talk about an all stock acquisition. Now, there's a third kind, there's a mix, right? And that gets kind of hairy. I'm not going to ask you to do that. I'll only ask you to calculate for cash acquisitions and for stock acquisitions. The cash is the easiest. So firm A is going to pay 150 in cash for firm B. And so now we can figure out our NPV for this project from the perspective of firm A. We're going to take that VB star, which is 200, and we are going to subtract out the cost to acquire firm B, which is 150. And so that NPV is positive 50. Ms. Volkova, do we take the project? Yes, because the NPV is positive. And by the way, keep in mind NPV, uh, we know for exam and homework purposes, a positive NPV always says take it. What if I'm out there throwing out a 150, uh, let's call these millions, 150 million bucks, and my NPV was only positive 1 million bucks? I'd walk away from that because the chance of our estimation of uh, delta V being off by 2 million is pretty high, right? Okay. So what's the value of the new firm? Well, keep in mind that when we are doing a cash-only acquisition, the only people that are left when everything is said and done are the uh, acquiring shareholders. What's happened to the target shareholders? We paid them off, they walk away, right? And so, if I were to tell you about a project that this company was going to take on that would add 50 million, all we would do is take the market value of the firm and add that 50 million, and that would give us the new value of the firm after accepting the project. And it's exactly the same way here. We're going to take that standalone value of A, which we got by multiplying the share price times the number of shares, and we're going to add the NPV. And that tells us that the value of this firm all together is now 550. Value of the firm altogether is now 550. And so the last question I could ask you is, what's the new price per share? Well, you have to go back and look and see that this firm previously had 25 shares. We're not issuing any more stock. And so we still have 25 shares. If I take 550 divided by 25 shares, I get $22 per share, $22 per share. I could have also worked it this way. NPV of 50, if I divide that by the number of shares, that's $2 per share. If I add that to the old stock price, I get exactly the same number, exactly the same number. Okay, now let's talk about something here. Um, 
VA plus VB plus delta B. And we said that a uh, standalone value of A was 500, standalone value of B was 100, and delta B was 100. What's that up to be? 700. 700. But we're saying here that the value after merger is only 550. It turns out that this equation is true for a stock acquisition. But if I am making a cash acquisition, remember that 150 in cash that we had to pay for that company? Do you think the standalone the stand value of A is still 500 after paying 150? No, it's really just 350. And so this thing becomes 550. And so you can add all those things together, but remember to subtract out the cash would be another way to get to exactly this same number, the, the, or piece of A and B that we got 550. Questions? Okay, one more time, I guarantee you, you're not getting this right now, right? But you have to be here now, so the next time you hear it is the second time. Usually I can get things on the second time. You know when my wife tells me something about turning my socks right side out? How many times does she have to tell me? Twice, right? It's the kind of thing. That's just the way humans are, so don't feel bad about it. Now, there are two ways that you can go back and get this kind of information. One is to go back and watch this live video when you get the chance, and the other is to go out and look for the examples. And I would do that if I were you. And if you don't see examples out there under chapter 21, let me know and I will put some stuff together and put it out there. I think they're out there. Okay, any questions about cash acquisition before we move on? Okay, now we're gonna do stock acquisition. So what do I, what do I have to do when I do a stock acquisition, I have to actually go out and issue some new stock. And I am going to then offer that stock to the target shareholders in exchange for their shares. And so we're gonna have two big changes here. Number one, we're gonna have more shares outstanding. And the other thing is we're gonna have some new shareholders. We're gonna have some new shareholders. Now let's talk about, well, no, we'll get to that later. Uh, we're doing just calculations right now. So if we're doing this, uh, are we gonna to have to subtract out the 150 in cash? No, because it's not cash going out, we're issuing stock instead. But we're gonna see that it has a, an effect on the other side. It has a, an impact on how we share the gains of the merger. Okay, so in the cash merger, the target uh, firm shareholders, they're going to get cash and no longer participate, but in the stock merger, they are going to become shareholders in the new firm. And so I've already said all that, we're going to be worth 700 when this is all said and done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that 700 and divide it by the number of shares outstanding after the merger, and that's going to give me my new share price. So. How many shares did A issue to buy D? Remember that A's shares were trading for $20 per share before all of this started. And so if I want to get $150, I have to take 150 divided by 20. Tells me I have to issue seven and a half new shares. Now at this point, students usually freak out. And they say, well, wait a minute, it's not possible to have decimal shares. In fact, it is. I've got decimal shares in my portfolios from mergers and all sorts of weird stuff, right? And so don't let that freak you out. So how many shares are outstanding now? Well, there were 25 before we started down this road. Now we're adding seven and a half new. 25 plus seven and a half tells us that it's 32 and a half shares outstanding after the issuance of these new shares. 
I ask you the share price, I told you just a little bit ago, if we want to find that out, all we have to do is take the value of the merged firm, which we know is 700, 500 plus 100 plus 100, and divide by the number of shares currently outstanding after the merger, and that's 32 and a half. And if you want to beat it out on your calculator, you'll see that that gives us $21.54 per share. Now I want you to recall what the share price was after the cash deal. What was it? 22, right? It was $22 per share. So which gives us a higher share price? Cash? cash. Or, yeah, cash does because we're diluting here. Okay, so what's the cost of acquiring B? Well, we had to give them seven and a half shares, and you're thinking those shares are worth 20, but in truth, they were worth 21.54, because that's what they're worth after the merger. Seven and a half times 21.54 tells us that we actually paid $161.55 to those folks for that company. Now that extra $11.55, that is money that was gonna to come to our shareholders that is now instead going to the target shareholders. That means our NPV is gonna be lower by that amount. So let's take a look at the NPV. Remember, it is VB star, which hasn't changed, still 200, minus the cost A to acquire B, which we just calculated is $161.55, and that gives us $38.45 for NPV. How much was it previously? 50. Now, the question is this. Is it still a positive NPV project? Yes. If you are the CEO of firm A, should you do a stock acquisition or a cash acquisition based on the uh, goal of financial management? Cash. Yeah, cash. Because remember the goal of financial management is to maximize shareholder wealth and we are going to have more money for our shareholders afterwards if we pay cash. So that's the first kind of clue that this stock acquisition is a little freaky. Um, and remember I said that extra 1155 went to the target 1155 plus 3845. Can you guess what that equals? 50, right? 50. We're just splitting up that game differently. Okay, now we can take that 3845 and divide by 25 original shares and see that that's an extra buck 54 per share. We add that to the old share price and it tells us the shares are 2154, which is what we've already calculated. Okay, so that all checks out. So, so far we know that with the share acquisition, uh, it's not as good for the acquiring um, shareholders. And uh, it, it can still be positive MPV, but it's not going to be as good for the acquiring shareholders. So, we've already talked about that first part. And so there's some things you should consider when choosing cash or choosing stock. So think about this. Uh, I just got through telling you that if you're going to make this deal, you would always do it with cash. But there might be some reasons to do it with stock. Uh, first of all, sharing gains or losses. Sharing gains or losses. Do people like to share gains? No. Do people like to share losses? No. Oh yeah, have you ever heard the expression misery loves company, right? And if I'm gonna lose 100 million, wouldn't I rather it be with Mr. Sadai and I as partners to lose 100 million than me by myself, right? Because then I'm only down 50 million. Does that make sense? Okay, so if someone comes out there with, uh, with an all stock offer, you might be wondering what kind of gain or losses are they expecting you to shoulder? And there are a couple of things. Number one, maybe the Delta V isn't as high as they're pretending it is, so there's gonna be some losses as a result of this whole thing. Or number two, um, another good reason that people might go out there and use stock is something called adverse selection. So, let's say 
that my stock is currently trading at $25 per share. I, as a manager, think my share is worth, my shares are worth $35. Would I use my shares to make an acquisition or would I use cash to make an acquisition? I think my shares are worth 35. The market's only currently valuing them at 25. I think my shares are undervalued. Would I, inter would I throw out new shares to buy this thing or am I gonna pay cash? Yeah, I'm gonna pay cash, right? But what if I think my shares are overvalued? Yeah, definitely shares. I'll give you an example. Uh, AOL Time Warner, we talked about it last time. During the dot-com boom, these shares were flying high. And whenever any of those firms would go out to make acquisitions, they would never use cash. And to me, it was a big old sign. And I was just back then, I was just an engineer, right? I still could see through them. Like, that lets you know they think their currency is inflated right now. They're using shares to buy instead of cash. And in the meantime, by the way, what are they telling us? Oh yeah, our shares are going to the moon. Hey pal, if you believe that, why are you using shares to buy other things. Just use cash, right? Does that make sense? Okay. And then uh, taxes. Cash, if we pay cash, this is the downside to cash, it usually results in taxes. Now, who has to pay the taxes? Usually the target shareholders. And I say usually because if we pay them more than what they eventually or originally paid for the shares, they have to pay a certain kind of tax. What's it called? Okay. It's a capital yeah, it's capital gain, right? If I'm paying them more for the shares than they paid for the shares, then they have a capital gain and they would have to pay capital gains tax. Now, uh, keep in mind that I am not currently responsible for the target shareholders. As the acquiring manager, the one making the decision to do this project, should I care one bit about the taxability of this thing? No, that's on the that's on the target shareholders. If they don't want to sell, they're not going to sell, right? Okay, and then finally, control. Control has value. How many of you like to hold on to the remote control while you're watching television? Go ahead, confess. I'm one of them, right? Control has value. Now let's assume that you have fifty percent plus one of the shares of the acquiring firm and you're going to go out and make an acquisition if you make an acquisition with stock now you've got less than 50 percent plus one of the shares and there is a possibility that someone else could get enough shares to then take control of the firm does that make sense do people want to share control no okay and so uh, cash doesn't affect control, but issuing shares can. So if I'm on this knife edge at 50% plus one, I for sure want to use cash and I don't want to issue stock. So which is more popular? I've told you that people might want to use shares because their shares are inflated and there's all sorts of things that go along with this, but in the end, it turns out that cash is usually more popular. And I think the big reason for that is that a lot of these acquisitions are small and we don't want to mess with all of the hurdles that come with issuing additional shares. When you issue additional shares, you've got to get the government involved and all sorts of other kind of stuff. But uh, let's, let's talk about Apple. Apple goes out and buys little companies that are doing things that Apple's interested in. Is Apple ever going to go out and buy Samsung? No. And so apples, they're very strategic in their acquisitions, but they're all small. None of them are going to change the culture of Apple and they do that on purpose. But as a result of those acquisitions being small, every single one of them gets done with cash. By the way, most of these acquisitions are like a rounding error for net income for Apple, right? And so five billion bucks and it's like, <laughs> not a problem, right? <laughs> there we go. Okay. So that's, uh, that's why it's more, one of the reasons cash is more popular. And then of course, there's also this adverse selection thing. And we talk about signaling. 
If I use shares to go out and buy something, I am signaling to the investing public that I, the manager who has more information about this thing than anybody else, I think my shares are overvalued. As soon as that word comes out, what do you think happens to my share price? Yeah, it goes down. You're like, whoo, Haggard thinks this thing isn't worth 25 bucks a share. So neither should we. Now, does anyone know for sure what the correct value is? No, but they know it's lower than the current stock price, so people are gonna vote with their feet and sell their shares. Questions? Okay, now that we've gotten through that, I'm gonna go back and we're going to, by the way, that's everything you need to know to do your homework. But of course you wanna do your practice, your homework, and look at examples because I guarantee you, you didn't get it from just that. Okay, let's talk about acquisition classifications. And there are three that we like to talk about. There are horizontal acquisitions. This is where both of the companies are in the same business. This is where both of the companies are in the same business and one buys another. And uh, so we had an example here of a cart of a cable company buying another cable company. That's a horizontal acquisition. Then we have, oh, and by the way, do you think the government might have something to say about your horizontal acquisition? No. Ms. Volkova, what might they say? Do you value the number? Yeah! Hey, pal, look at that. You're going to have like 70% of the market after you do this. And we are going to step in to protect who? Uh, consumers, right? Because what do monopolies tend, or, or at least these big players, they tend to do what with their prices? Yeah, they tend to go up. So horizontal acquisitions, we actually say in finance that they make sense from a financial standpoint, but they might get government on your back. The next is the vertical acquisition, and that's where the target and the bidder are at different stages of the production process. So, the classic example is oil. Where does oil come from? The Middle East, he says. <laughs> More generally, sir. Is it for, we pull it out of the air? No, we're pulling it out of the ground. Yeah, we're pulling it out of the ground. And so there are these people called operators. Actually, there are people called drillers that go out and drill the wells. There are people called operators that get the oil out of the ground. There are people called refiners that turn the crude oil into the different products. And then there are the retailers that sell the gasoline, the jet fuel, and so forth. Now let's say that I am a refiner. In fact, I'm gonna give you a very specific refiner to think about. It's a company called Valero. And Valero, in the beginning, was just a refining company. But then they decided to buy some gas stations. And I'll tell you where they got the stations from here in a minute. But they decided to buy a bunch of gas stations. Why? Because they're in the same value chain, but they're just trying to capture more of that value chain. Now, after they buy the, uh, the gas stations, things work out so well, what might be their next move? What else might they buy? Remember this whole chain? Drillers, operators, refiners, retailers. Maybe they go out and buy an operator. And then maybe after they get into that business and they get comfortable, maybe they buy the driller. And now they're controlling it entirely from the ground to the gas pump, which is exactly how Rockefeller got rich. You guys know about, I even forget, is John, John D. Rockefeller? That's how he got rich, was he did this vertical acquisition where he basically controlled the entire value chain. And then we have the conglomerate acquisition. You're gonna hear two different stories about this from me and from your strategy professor. Because your strategy professor is likely to tell you that this is a good thing. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you it's not. So let me give you an example here. Um, oh, and by the way, what does conglomerate acquisition mean? 
It means that you're buying a company in an entirely different line of business than yours, in an entirely different kind of business than yours. Now, let's talk about something that they talk about in strategy so you know about it when you get there. Related diversification. Related diversification can actually make sense. After you've already uh, you've done your whole market and you still need to you still want to grow, maybe related diversification makes sense. So yesterday my wife and I took eight delightful Chinese people to Prime Inc. here in town. What does Prime Inc. do? Trucking. Yeah, trucking. And uh, the guy was giving the talk and he mentioned that they have, of course, these different divisions and mo one of their more recent acquisitions. Watch, I didn't know watch, you see plants. It's just, it's crazy. <laughs> okay, so one of their recent acquisitions was a flower company. And they, so we fly in the flowers from South America to Miami and uh, someplace in California, probably El Segundo. Anyway, so they, then they load them on a certain kind of truck. What kind of truck do you have to put flowers on? Refrigerated, refrigerated trucks. Well, it turns out that Prime is the biggest operator of refrigerated trucks in the United States. And so this is not quite the business they've been in before, which is carrying food products in refrigerated trailers. Oh, and by also, also uh, pharmaceuticals like the COVID vaccine, they carried it around too. But they do know refrigerated trucking. So that moving into that business is related diversification. And I'm fully behind that as long as it's positive NPV. In fact, I'm up for any as long as it's positive NPV. But let's talk about the danger of conglomerate acquisition. Let's say that I grew up in the oil field and I have been doing oil my entire life and I know nothing about ice cream. But we go out and buy Ben and Jerry's. That's a conglomerate acquisition. Does that sound like a good idea? Do I have any idea about that market? No. Do I have any idea about that value chain? No. So one of the reasons we say conglomerate acquisition is a bad idea is because it takes the company away from its core competency. Prime, when they bought that flower transportation group, did not move away from their core competency. Maybe they had to learn a little something new about flowers, but that was it, right? But when you do something weird, like buying the oil company, buying the ice cream company, you've done something bad. Now let's give an example of bad. Has anyone here heard of Sarah Lee? Is it like bread? Okay, everyone in your generation says bread. My generation says pie. Now let's talk about how Sarah Lee got started. If you roll back to 1939, Hitler invades Poland. I'm pretty sure you didn't expect that one to show up. Hitler invades Poland, World War II starts, and the men all have to go fight. But someone's gonna build Okay. Good. Good. Someone's got to build the airplanes, right? Someone's got to build the tanks. And so for the first time, they let a group of people actually get in there and make good money doing industrial jobs. What would we call this group of people? Women. Women. Thank you. Okay. So we got Rosie the Riveter. She's in there building ships and it's all good. And then after the war, uh, we bomb nuclear bomb Japan. The war's over. What happens next to the men? They come home! And what do the men expect? To get their jobs back. Now, there were, there were a lot of women who said, whew, thank goodness, I hated that. And they go back home, and that's fine. But there were some women that were like, damn, I kind of like having my own money. If I told you about our money and her money, right? Mm -hmm. Any money she brings home to her money? Okay, so uh, she, she likes having money that she can, you know, do things with. And so she decides to stay on the job. Now, keep in mind, this is 1950s America. We're talking about the Cleavers, you know, from Leave it to Beaver, if you ever watched that on Nick at Night or whatever. What kind of roles were women before the war expected to fulfill in the home? Who did the cooking? The women. Who did the cleaning? The women. The women. Uh, who did the laundry? The women. the women, right? Okay, so now, after the men have come home from the war and the wife says, you know what? I really like working for Lockheed. I'd like to stay there at the factory. The husband says, fine, but I'm not 
cooking, cleaning, or doing the laundry. And so she's like, oh, crap. What's the next thing? Well, Sarah Lee says, wait a minute. She no longer has time to make pies. Hmm. Which remember, we say American has apple pie, right? How could you be an American if you, there was no apple pie? So what does Sarah Lee do? They come up with this frozen pie that mom can pick up on her way home from the factory or the office. And she can put that in the oven. And then by the time you're through eating the rest of the meal, the pie's ready. And by the way, it tastes better than mom's, or at least it tastes better than my mom's. Okay, so yeah, she doesn't watch me on YouTube, so it's all good. Okay, so um, this is how they get started. And it turns out it's wildly popular. But do you think that the market for frozen pies is limitless? No, there's a limit to them. And so Sarah Lee still wants to grow. Uh, so they, they start thinking about, well, you know, what else is kind of similar? This idea of related diversification. And that's when they get into bread. They say, well, the customer is exactly the same. It's the grocery stores. Um, and and they, they, they come up with several reasons why this is a good idea. Uh, but then they, uh, so, the, so they do the merger. Now, let's ask what kinds of differences there are between frozen pies and bread. First of all, frozen pies. What do you think the shelf life is on those? They're frozen. It's months, right? Do you think I ever look at expiration dates on frozen foods when I pull them out of my freezer? Heck no. Whew, just eat it, right? What about bread? I can get a loaf of bread to last two weeks before it starts turning green. Now, I noticed Ms. Volkova wrinkled her nose. And my Chinese students, unfortunately, we don't have any hair, but they were like, ah, no. And so when my wife and I get to China and we're wanting to go buy a loaf of bread, but all they've got are these little short loaves of bread. And we're like, what the hell, why are they? But we get it home, after three days, it's green. Why? It doesn't have the preservatives in it. Okay, so, but still two weeks is far, 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 far shorter than months, right? And so now we're talking about a, a perishable good that expires quickly. And also, um, maybe I can make one shipment every two weeks of frozen pies to a grocery store. How often do we expect the bread guy to show up? Multiple times a week. Yeah, multiple times a week, right? And so we see that there's some differences in these businesses, but they were, they were close enough that Sarah Lee was able to make a go of it. Now, after they've grown as much as they can in the bread area, they say, well, wait a minute, we still want to grow. What else can we do? And so I, I can picture it in my head. There's one of these corporate brainstorming sessions in which you got a bunch of marketing folks, a couple of accountants, and then they're throwing things around. And, and someone, one of these like dreamy, whimsical free thinkers says, well, let's talk about what goes with dessert. And someone says, coffee. And they write that on the big flip chart. And someone else says, uh, cigarettes. Because back then everybody would smoke and eat pie and drink coffee together, right? And so someone says, no, we can't do cigarettes. That's, that doesn't stick with our squeaky clean family image. But after the whole discussion's over, they figure out, well, coffee's really our best bet. And so they buy this European coffee company that no one had ever heard of here called Dewey Egberts. Have you ever heard of Dewey Egberts? Yeah, there's a reason. Okay, now, Dewey Egbert, same uh, customer base we're shooting for, which is the supermarkets, the same household customer too, right? And so they get into the coffee business. Now, so far, we can make at least some sort of far-fetched argument that this is related diversification. But after they milk everything they can out of the coffee business, they say, well, what else can we do? And they start looking around for companies that they can buy, and their eyes settle on Hanes. What does Hanes make? Clothing. What's that? Clothing. Clothing, specifically. Undergarments. Undergarments, very good. Okay, so Hanes is a clothing company. They make undergarments. Now, let me ask you this. What do the people at Sara Lee know about the underwear industry? Practically nothing. In fact, the only relation I can see between these things is if you eat too much of Sara Lee's pies, 
you'll need to go buy some bigger underwear. That's pretty much it, right? Or you change into them after you eat the powder, maybe? I don't know. It's you the think, next step so in your day. Think about <laughs> this. How about cross promotion? Buy three pairs of briefs. Get a free Get two dollars off a pie. Who's, as a customer, wouldn't that just confuse the <laughs> snot out of you to see that? And you wonder what's going on? Okay. Now, conglomerate acquisition. Um, and I'll usually have one or two people who will argue with me and they'll try to give me an example of a conglomerate that works. And one of the examples of a conglomerate that works was General Electric. And they're like, oh yeah, but what about General Electric? Folks, do you know what's happened to General Electric? Holy crap, they've just, right? It's not good. And in fact, we can see when two companies go together in a conglomerate acquisition, the, total, the overall value is decreased. Delta V is negative. And then when we see that they split back apart, the share prices pop up. So there's a piece of evidence that conglomerates are value destroying. By the way, what's our goal of financial management? Nice. Maximize shareholder wealth. Do we ever want to destroy value? Absolutely not. Now here's my other piece of advice that conglomerates aren't that great of a thing. Most of the time when you see people do a conglomerate acquisition, just wait 10, 15 years. That thing will come undone. I gave you an example in one of your discussion pieces. We have Intel who makes chips. And they went out and bought a company called Mobileye. Mobileye doesn't make necessarily all that much hardware. What they're doing is this uh, self-driving stuff, right? And they're putting together the system. Basically, they're taking bits and pieces made by other people and they're creating the software to tell if little Timmy has ridden his tricycle out in front of your car. That's what they're doing. That's a conglomerate, that might be related to diversification, is really more conglomerate acquisition. And that thing, that marriage made in hell, is coming back apart, right? You see that all the time. When eBay bought Skype, what happened? It eventually comes apart. Do you think they asked professors how long we should wait before the projector goes off? <laughs> Absolutely not. There we go. I'm going to back to your prime example of how cool men are on prime. <laughs> I appreciate you biting your tongue. Just don't make it bleed. Okay, back to the story. Um, and then, so what do you eventually think happened to Sarah Lee? Do you think they're still in the underwear business? No. No, they sold off the underwear. And it was, and it was, uh, it was a big deal when they did it. And uh, would you be surprised to learn that when they got rid of that, that the value of Haynes plus Sarah Lee added together was greater than the value of Haynes Sarah Lee when it was all one piece. They had destroyed value and that value got liberated when they split ways. I am pleased that we made it through that entire discussion with no one saying anything about edible underwear. There's usually one person that mentions that and I appreciate that we don't have those sorts of perverts in this class. Okay, on with the story, yes? So why do conglomerates continue to happen? Oh, this is a great question. Why do conglomerates have, continue to happen? Remember, I told you that they're talking about growing the company. By the way, uh, the, the managers are gonna tell you they're growing the company for whose benefit? Sure. The shareholders, but we know from chapter one that there's also this element of empire building. Who's more important? the manager of just Sarah Lee's frozen pies, or if they're also in charge of uh, the bread, the coffee, and the underwear, right? So empire building is reason number one. Hubris is reason number two. And I've seen this myself. They're like, hey, this person can do any sort of management they put their mind to. In fact, this came out of World War, back to World War II. Uh, there were all these wonderkin that went to work for the government to try to put our economy on a war footing, manufacturing that sort of thing. And they come out of that and now they have this idea that, well, hey, a smart person can run anything through these scientific management principles. 
And so that was the beginning of the big, of building these huge uh, conglomerates because, and they sold this idea and people bought into it. And so you see companies like Litton, Litton, which uh, you guys probably don't realize, it, it's, a, it's a defense contractor, I think, still. Uh, but at one point they were also making microwave ovens and stuff like that. But then we get into the 1980s and we start to realize that this stuff really isn't working. But with like every other thing that we learn is a bad deal, the people who learn that lesson the hard way die off. And in their place springs another group of people. And those people are ignorant and they have to learn the hard lessons themselves. And so once again, conglomeration gets thrown up the flagpole as a way to build value. And then and we move forward and go through the cycle again. I'm going to give you one more example along those lines. Socialism. And probably some of you in this classroom might describe yourselves as socialists. Any of us that were around during that time when socialism was very popular, we know what that led to. We know, and I'm going to ask Ms. Volk about it. Was Russia uh, better off economically as the Soviet Union or say in 2006, after the fall of the Soviet Union? Let's ask from a perspective of how long did you have to wait in line for a loaf of bread? Oh, yeah. In 2006 then. 2000, oh yeah, oh yeah, a whole lot better. And, but the problem is this, why do you think socialism is becoming popular again? It's intuitively, instinctively uh, attractive to some people, and they haven't lived long enough to see what it actually looks like in practice, right? It's a neat idea. And the same thing happens with gold conglomeration. If you haven't lived through it to see what kind of value it destroys, you don't realize it's such a bad idea. And so you can start as a manager, you can sell that idea to other people so you can have your empire. Does that make sense? Okay. So now let's talk about proxy contests. Remember we said the proxy is the right to vote someone else's shares. And uh, if I can't manage to afford to uh, get all of the shares that I need to vote for a merger, I can instead get people, ask people to vote their shares in my favor. And so I'm gonna ask you all, if you'll give me the right to vote your shares, or at the very least, vote for the slate of directors that I'm setting forward. And keep in mind that I'm some, probably some person with a, a small percentage of the shares, but I'm trying to affect change at the company. Now, what's the advantage here? Boy, it's a whole lot cheaper than buying the shares. A whole lot cheaper, because I don't have to buy them in order to get the votes. The downside is it's difficult to succeed. And I'm gonna give you two um, examples here of, of proxy contests. The first happened at Disney. You guys know Disney with the mouse and all that? Okay, so the first happened at Disney. Uh, Disney was founded by Walt Disney, and he's actually from Missouri, if you didn't know that. Uh, Walt Disney, and uh, he's very successful, and then Walt dies. And over time, what happens is uh, the only person left on the board with Disney in his name is a man named Roy Disney, who's Walt's nephew or as the people at Disney referred to him, Walt's idiot nephew, because they didn't like Roy very much. Now, moving forward in time, uh, the year's 1983 or 84, Disney gets a new CEO. It's a guy named Michael Eisner. And back in that period of time, we only had three channels on the television, and one of them on Sunday nights, they had the wonderful world of Disney or whatever it is. And I was shocked to see this guy, Michael Eisner, he shows up at the beginning of the show and he says, hello, I'm Michael Eisner. I'm the new CEO of Disney. I wanted to introduce myself and, and just watching him, I turn around to my mom. I'm like, this guy's gonna do great things, right? Because I was a little nerd even then. And so Michael Eisner, sure enough, he went in there and by the way, he's probably in his early 40s at the time. He goes in there, he kicks butts, he kicks names, he cleans up some problems 
and then he starts moving into some new areas. For instance, Euro Disney. Do you guys know about Euro Disney? And then he starts, we've got Disney in, I think, Tokyo now, Shanghai, Hong Kong. And so he did that international theme park expansion. Additionally, he did some good acquisitions like Pixar, some stuff like that. I think Pixar was, that, well, I know they bought one of those kind of companies like Pixar. Okay, so that all really kind of makes sense. But here's what happens to CEOs as they get older. They start to lose energy. They start to become more risk averse. By the way, why is this true? Because they're humans, right? Because they're humans. And so as they get old, as Michael Eisner got older, he became more and more risk averse and he became more and more uh, just, just wanted the quiet life, right? Is that what Disney shareholders are looking for? No, they're looking for someone to go out there and create value. And so Roy Disney, who by the way, didn't like Michael Eisner anyway, he starts uh, a proxy campaign. And he says, folks, this Michael Eisner, he's not producing the value for us that we deserve. And so we need to get rid of him. And so Roy puts up a slate of directors that would uh, boot Eisner out for election. And um, Disney, of course, has their preferred slate of electors, uh, directors who would keep Michael Eisner. Now, by the time everything is said and done, 43% of the shares that vote, vote for the opposing slate of directors. That's a vote, that's a vote of limited confidence in Michael Eisner, right? Now, let's ask what do you think happens next? Even though theoretically, Roy has lost the proxy contest. The next thing that happens is the board has a meeting. They're like, Damn, that was a whole lot closer than I thought it would be. And they start saying things like, Ooh, if we don't do something, we may eventually get voted out of these phony baloney jobs that we've got here on the board of directors, right? I like coming down here to Florida every winter, you know, for the, the board meeting, right? And bringing my wife and my German Shepherd cupcake. I love that on the private jet. So what are we gonna do as a board? Hmm. Well, we can't write out fire, Michael, because that would make him look bad and it would make it look like we knew that was the right decision all along. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to invite Michael in and talk to him and, and we're going to make him this offer. So we invite Michael in and we say, Michael, first of all, thank you so much for your many, many years of dedicated service here at Disney. Disney is a far better and more valuable company today than it would have been without you. And that's true, right? And then they say, you know, in fact, we think it is so, your vision for Disney is so, so, so important that we want you to train your successor. You think Michael's starting to wonder what's going on? Actually, Michael already knows what's going on because after all, 43% of the shares voted to get rid of it, right? And so Michael says, I'm listening. He said, here's what we propose to do. Over the next two years, we're gonna, and you can be involved in choosing your successor. We're not really gonna let him pick, but we'll just say that. You can be involved in, in choosing your successor. And then over the next two years, we want you to train that successor. And as, uh, as the successor becomes competent in different areas, we'll just turn those areas over to him, take them off your plate, give you a well-deserved rest. And at the end of the two-year period, then the successor will become the sole CEO and you will become the emeritus CEO and consultants. By the way, we don't want to lose your valuable organizational knowledge. So we're going to pay you $2 million per year uh, to be a consultant for Disney. Now, what do you think Michael says? Yes. He says yes. He sees the writing on the wall, right? He, he knows that this is the carrot. If the carrot doesn't work, what are they going to get out? Do you guys know about the carrot and the stick? Well, let me explain a little human behavior to you, only it's actually mule behavior. Um, if you want the mule to move forward, there are two ways to do it. You can hold a carrot in front of the mule, and then the, the mule moves toward the carrot. This is the humane way, right? Well, what if the mule doesn't move? 
and you beat it, right? I'm not saying you should, but that's the way it works, right? Now, Michael is the mule. They put out this lovely carrot, but if Michael doesn't chomp on that carrot, do you think they'd be happy to drop him in the street? Absolutely. Does that make sense? So I'm watching Michael Eisner 10 years after this is all done. And he's on like one of these stupid morning shows, like the Today Show. And he's talking to someone and they're like, well, you know, what have you been doing with your time? He's like, oh, I've been writing kids' books. By the way, everybody thinks they can write kids' books. <laughs> Meghan Markle? Really? She's like, who's us now? <laughs> Okay, we'll talk about the royal family on another day. Back to the story. Back to the story. So he says, oh, I've been writing these, these kids' books. It's really great because I've got my grandkids, and they sit on my knee, and I read them these books I wrote just for them. And they say, well, are you happy with your life? He's like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I guarantee you if they came to him tomorrow and said, hey, would you like to be back at Disney? He'd say, yeah. He'd be right back in there, right? Okay. Now, the other story I want to tell you is about a group of restaurants called Darden. You ever heard of Darden? They have, or had at one point, Olive Garden, uh, Red Lobster, uh, Smoky Bones Barbecue, whatever the hell that is. But anyway, so they had a, a bunch of restaurant groups. It's a southern thing. What's that? It's a southern thing. It's yeah. a southern thing. We had them in Florida. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, I remember reading that. Okay, so back to the story. Um, it turns out that uh, Olive Garden, back in the day, was a really good idea and it took off. But then, uh, like anything else, if you don't pay attention to it and you don't nurture it, things start to go to hell in a hurry. And Olive Garden had actually started going downhill badly and the sales were showing that. And so a group called Starlight Capital comes in and they actually put forward a turnaround plan. First of all, they buy up like 4.999% then they put out this turnaround plan and they talk about uh, what needs to be done. And the two things that I remember that really stuck out was number one, stop handing out so many breadsticks. They used to have a two in plus one rule for breadsticks. If there were two people, oh no, an in plus one rule. If there were two people at the table, you give them three breadsticks. If there are five people at the table, you give them six breadsticks. And this, every time that my wife and I would go to the Olive Garden, we used to go, Olive Garden, would give, they would give us three bird sticks. And I would look at the server and I would say, are you trying to start a fight? <laughs> right? Because my wife and I are going to fight over that last bird stick because that's the kind of animals we are. Okay, so, but instead now, what was happening? The, the servers, because they're kind of lazy, by the way, I've got a server here. Would you like to keep bringing hot, fresh breadsticks over and over and over again to people's table? Or would you rather just take eight breadsticks and say, here you go, pigs? Yes, but that's funny because I was just in Olive Garden yesterday with uh, a group of people. And? And the server kept bringing us as many as we wanted because they wanted to keep us satisfied. Right. And so there's an agency problem there, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a balance to be struck. And that is, you don't want to bring so many that they're cold by the time they get a hold of them. Because those things are greasy, slippery, and gross when they're, right? Okay, back to the story. So the Olive Garden, that's one of the things that they said. We need to get back to the, don't do that to me. We need to get back to the N plus one rule. And, the, and also, we need to start salting the pasta. Olive Garden had bought some new pots. And the new pots had a warranty on them. But the warranty was only good if you didn't use salt water in the pot. Anyone here ever cook pasta? What do you need to put in the water to make it worth a crap? Salt. salt. And so the pasta was, was crap. And all for the sake of keeping the warranty on these pots. And so that was another thing that they put forward. And this was really interesting because it's one of the few proxy contests I can think of that was actually successful because when they put this slate of directors out there for the shareholders to vote on, the shareholders voted overwhelmingly for their slate. And so that meant that they got rid of the old board of directors and then they were able to implement this improvement plan. And you can go out and read what happened after that, but of course things actually got better at Olive Garden and therefore better for the shareholders. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's talk about going 
private. Most of the time, CEOs are people like me. They don't come from wealthy families. Uh, they basically have a good education and they're willing to work hard, uh, but they really don't have a lot of wealth on their own. And so uh, we see those people in charge of the company and uh, they'll occasionally go try to take over a company and it's called the leveraged buyout. And the reason it's called the leveraged buyout or it may be also MBO management buyout is because you borrow money to do it. Remember, I don't come from a background of wealth, but usually what happens is the um, investment banker comes to the CEO and says, Mr. Hopkins, we've been appreciating everything that you've been doing at Kraft Foods. We think you're a great CEO. What does Mr. Hopkins say? Thank you. Thanks, I agree. Right? And then we say, you know, the only thing that would make this better is if instead of you being the manager, what if it could be your company? Now, is that attractive to Mr. Hopkins? For a couple of reasons. Number one, he's starting to see dollar signs. Number two, uh, nobody likes being told what to do. If Mr. Hawkes owns the company, who's gonna be telling him what to do? Yeah, okay, so now, why is the investment banker interested in doing this? Because the investment banker is going to issue some junk bonds that are collateralized by the uh, assets of this firm that allows Mr. Hawkes to then buy the firm. Now you say, wait a minute, how can you borrow money against something you don't own? If you've ever bought a car on a loan, you've done it, right? Because the collateral for the loan is the car. Now, the investment banker wants to do this because after all, they're gonna get flotation costs, right? Mr. Hawkes wants to do it. And so everybody's happy, Mr. Hawkes takes the company private. And then the very next day, it's like 7.30 in the morning, and Mr. Hawkes' assistant comes in and says, Mr. Hawkes, I haven't seen you here in such a long time this early in the day. What's happened? Now let's talk about what happened the night before. The deal gets finalized. There's a big party. We pop some champagne. Mr. Hawkes perhaps has a little too much, but he wakes up the next morning and he has a headache. And it's not just because of the champagne. And here's why. He says, oh, wait a minute. He says, I owe a boatload of money, and the first coupon on those bonds comes due in six months. I gotta figure out where to get that money. Now, what's Mr. Hawkins gonna do? He's gonna start doing all the things he should have been doing all along as a manager. He's gonna start cutting wastes. He's going to start looking into, um, well, he's gonna cut, cut costs. He's gonna get rid of uh, divisions he shouldn't have had anyway. He's gonna, he's gonna do all, he's gonna deconglomerate the, the company. And so this is all gonna actually create value and this is a good thing. Now, remember I told you that Mr. Hawkes, um, he is doing this because he's got six months to raise that first coupon's worth of money. So he's gonna try to sell a bunch of stuff so he can pay down that debt so those coupons get smaller. You know, he has to pay a smaller amount of coupons every time. We call this the disciplining effect of debt. The disciplining effect of debt is this. Do you guys remember in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the song that the dwarves sing on the way down to the mine? This is the 1930s classic, not that freaky stuff that came later. What do they sing? Hi-ho, hi-ho. Yeah, hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go, right? This is a disciplining effect of debt. I owe, I owe. It's off to work I go. This morning, the alarm went off. My wife says you gotta get up, you gotta teach today. I said, I don't feel like it. Then I felt this sharp toenail jab right in my box. She said, you don't go to work. We can't pay the mortgage. We'll lose the house. I'm like, oh, crap. So I got up, took a shower, and I'm here, right? You think that's a true story? Yeah, your house is paid up. No, it's not. <laughs> Let's explain why that is. I'm over time here, but I'm going to tell you why that is. I borrowed that money back when a dollar was worth far more, right? 
I'm going to pay that loan back with dollars that ain't worth squat. Why? Why are the dollars not going to be worth near as much? Inflation. And I'll ask you who you can thank for that. You can make your own answers. Questions? <laughs>